Hi, I'm Karen Kinzel, the director of the Palo Alto Art Center, and I'm delighted to introduce you to Creative Attention, Art and Community Restoration. Creative Attention is an initiative that includes an exhibition that you're going to hear more about tonight with Ann Trinka uh, that is on view through May 21st, two artist residencies, community art therapy workshops with provisional art therapist on Tron and wellness programs, including free virtual meditation sessions on Thursday at noon. I want to thank the numerous individuals and institutions who helped to make this initiative possible. First, our funders, the Institute of Museum and Library Services and the National Endowment for the Arts and Pamela and David Hornick. I also want to thank the numerous Palo Alto Arts Center Foundation members and donors for their support. Thank you. I want to thank the staff who helped to make this initiative possible. Joseph Sachs, our lead preparator. Anna Soland, our exhibition registrar. Our installation team of Leanna, Cynthia, Amy, and Danny. I want to thank Emer Picardo, our marketing coordinator, who helped to create digital uh, accessible interpretive programs in conjunction with the show, and Stephanie Barajas, who is our Creative Attention Program Coordinator, who helped to support the initiative. I also want to thank the incredible work of the Art Center staff, who've worked so diligently during the pandemic and into recovery. Creative Attention began with an idea that art can help to bring people together and can be a tool for healing. Anne Trinka, our guest curator, took that idea and ran with it, creating a very compelling exhibition featuring the work of artists from the Bay Area and beyond. I want to thank her for all of her work to curate the exhibition and want to welcome her to share more with you in this walkthrough. Hi, my name is Anne Trinka and I'm the curator for the exhibition Creative Attention at the Palo Alto Art Center. And I'm going to be walking you through some of the artwork and introducing you to the 18 artists who've participated in this remarkable exhibition. And I just want to thank the staff and the community at Palo Alto Art Center for letting me have this opportunity to bring this great exhibition to you. Okay, we are outside the Palo Alto Art Center with this big piece by Marcel Pardo Ariza. Marcel is a trans visual artist who is active in the LGBTQ community. And this project stemmed from another work called Kin Streets, which was part of the kiosk program on Market Street. And the Kin Streets celebrates kinship and resilience among the queer and trans community. On this mural, Marcel features activists, DJs, performers, and um, other LGBTQ artists. And inside we'll see more posters from that Kin Streets project. I just really love the fact that Marcel is celebrating transgenerational activism and bringing uh, queer activists from the past together with current heroes. And this theme of belonging and kinship and support is just another aspect of art and healing. We're so delighted that Marcel is one of our artists in residence for Creative Attention. And as part of the residency, Marcel will be working with the Avenidas Rainbow Collective, which is their group of LGBTQ plus seniors, uh, doing a series of workshops this spring focused on personal storytelling using collage and photography and printing. Um, so those will be happening later on this spring and we're looking forward to that. And now we're in the glass gallery inside an installation by the artist Wes Bruce. Wes Bruce grew up in Northern California in the foothills and his backyard was forests and rivers. And so this installation takes inspiration from the river. And the title is Drift, which has multiple meanings that can mean being caught in a drift, drifting out to space. Wes likes to play a lot with language, obviously. There's a lot of poetry involved in this installation, and he's used mirrors and fabric and drawings to make a space that is very meditative and renewing. There are many things to look at, including found objects strung along the wall that have personal meaning to Wes and also just talk about circumstance and spontaneity 
and there are hanging from the ceilings these dyed fabrics that are the blue of the water. So he meant this space to be a place where you can dive down and think about um, daily rituals and adventure. And I really hope that people come in. There are cushions. You can make yourself comfortable, read the poetry, look at all of the words, and just truly relax and renew yourself. So we're in front of an installation by artist Christine Wong Yap. We're going to talk a little bit more about Christine when we move into the gallery. Christine is a social practice artist who's interested in exploring components of psychological well-being, particularly belonging. And we asked her to create this belonging map um, to complement her residency as part of creative attention. And in this map, we're asking community members to identify places of belonging in Palo Alto, in East Palo Alto, and even around the world. And so we hope to have this wonderful crowdsource document of places of belonging throughout our community uh, as part of this installation. Right now, we're standing in front of the work of Christine Wong Yap. She is a Bay Area artist who is well known for mapping cities around places of security and uh, inclusiveness. So she has done several projects under the umbrella Belonging, and we are featuring some of the artifacts from those projects here. She did a project in Albuquerque, I believe was one of her first ones, and she surveys people in the local area to ask them where they feel a sense of belonging. And then she creates certificates that go to either the business or the place or the spot where that person mentioned that they have that feeling. She's also done the project in Berkeley with the Institute of um, Othering and Belonging. And uh, she also has these bandanas to my left that signify people who carry belonging with them. They didn't indicate a particular place, but she's using quotes from their interviews and she made them into bandanas so they can carry that with them. Christine Wong Yap is our other artist in residence in connection with creative attention. And Christine is working with local teens, teens in the Art Center Teen Leadership Program, and also a class at Eastside Prep in East Palo Alto. And she's working with the teens to identify places and the people um, in which they feel like they belong. Um, she is working with them to teach them calligraphy to kind of document these ideas of belonging. And then the teens are interviewing seniors at Avenidas and uh, seniors in their community to identify more places of belonging. And the teens are doing line drawings of the seniors. So this installation will change in March. Christine will actually include documents of her residency. Um, so you'll be able to see some of the, the things that the teens and the seniors have done together. I should also mention that Christine designed the visual identity for the exhibition. Uh, Christine works in a wide range of media, social practice, uh, drawing, printmaking, publishing. She also does calligraphy and lettering, and we have a great example of that in the title for the show. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about the three artists that are in this space. They're all using very different mediums. The first one to my right is Jeremiah Jenkins, and he really likes to push the boundaries of material. He is a ceramicist, but as you can see, he's using thrown pottery and broken pottery. The series is called Functional, and it has to do with the state of uh, our emotional health during the pandemic. And Jeremiah finds broken pottery and throws it into the kiln with his own pottery and kind of sees what sticks. And you can see that the vessels are whole and they're usable, but they're surrounded by sharp uh, shards of broken pottery, and therefore you have to handle them very carefully, like we have to handle ourselves very carefully. Jeremiah also is interested in uh, kintsugi, the Japanese art of repairing broken things, and you can see that in his work as well. And next to Jeremiah's work, we have the work of Lisa Solomon. Lisa is a multimedia artist. She's an illustrator, and she also works in textiles. And this piece uh, combines some of her dual 
identity as a half Japanese, half Jewish person. She recalls some of the handiwork from those cultures and what these images are, they're embroidered hands and the piece is called Senju Kanon and that refers to the number 1000. The number 1000 in uh, Japan is a important number. It is something that is monumental yet achievable and you'll see it oftentimes in the thousand cranes or other cultural references. So she's done one in multiple colors, and then she leaves the center thread hanging loose, which she says alludes to time and memory and also grief. And over here on my left, we have the work of Esther Trago. Esther lives in Sebastopol, California, which is a very naturally wonderful place. She spends a lot of time in the woods. Uh, she was one of the artists I first thought of when curating this show because she likes to think of her work as protecting nature. She finds objects that are broken like shells or leaves and she actually crochets with a golden thread around the object. And she also is referring here to kintsugi, the Japanese art of mending. Um, here she has a branch that is crocheted with this golden thread and in kintsugi, gold is used to repair broken cracks and therefore it makes the object more valuable than it was before it was broken. Also, she has a set of rocks that are covered in the embroidery and she says that this piece is about, uh, in a way, the pandemic and our social distancing. It's also about relationships. The rocks are in pairs and she's crocheted around except for the point where they meet. So she's talking about relationships between people, but also our relationship with the natural world. Okay, I'm standing in front of work by an artist named Lynn Beldner. Lynn is another multimedia artist. She uh, does photography, but also textile and sculpture. She lives in Woodland, California, and the pieces here to my right are called Emergency Blankets. And Lynn started these works after 9-11, as a response to this feeling of anxiety and fear. And they're sort of scaled down blankets like the ones we all carried when we were young. It's something you could you know, take with you and feel security. A lot of her work is about post-traumatic stress. And she has a vocabulary of symbols and drawings and objects that she makes that kind of restore her and make her feel better. And in turn, while we look at them, we feel that sense of security. To my left, this is a piece called The Noise They Make, and they're small glass vials that contain drawings by Lynn, and they're big enough to just put in your pocket, and I think the title refers to the clinking sound, which is a very comforting noise, and the glass vials might seem delicate, but they're actually very resilient and strong. And this is the work of Tucker Nichols, a Bay Area artist, and it was one of the first responses to the pandemic that I saw from artists in the area. It's called Flowers for Sick People, and it was a way of Tucker being able to reach out to people who were falling ill and to comfort those who maybe couldn't be with their loved ones during the pandemic. And he created these flowers and also a website, Flowers for Sick People, where you could request that he send a flower painting to someone in need. And this work really shows that kindness is an act of resilience. Tucker also recently published a book called Flowers in the Dark, Notes from the Infusion Center, that talks about his dealing with chronic illness. So I really feel that Tucker represents the art and healing community. Now we're in front of the work of Kenyatta A.C. Hinkle, and Kenyatta is an artist, an activist, and a healer. This work has to do with water in a reference to climate change, but also in the uh, political reference to black people's history with water in different communities. She uses found images from magazines and combines them with her own painting to bring about um, memories of her ancestors. Then over here, we have the work of Maria Paz. Maria is a self-taught artist. She was born in Chile and uh, grew up in Southern California. Her vessels incorporate all of the memories and 
stories that her ancestors passed down through their immigration experience. And you'll see she uses a lot of images from Chile and also angels and spirits that refer to the people who have passed on that she's communicating through with her work. So this is the work of Alexander Hernandez, and it is another piece mending different aspects of his personal experience. He was born in Oaxaca and raised in Colorado, and this work is an expression of memories watching telenovelas and animes while he was discovering his queer identity. The piece Siempre Pienso in El Ayer, Always Thinking About Yesterday, is part of a current series he's working on using Mexican song lyrics that his mother used to sing around the house. And on the floor is a piece called Beauty in the Binge, which was made during quarantine to reflect the anxieties that underserved communities felt already but were amplified by the lockdown. So nature is another theme that repeatedly came up when we were looking at artists for this show. And Paz de la Calzada was a natural fit because of her interest in botanicals and native medicines. And for this project, she actually sourced some needles from the Palo Alto redwood tree, which is the tree the city has its name for. And she made these tinctures with boiling the needles and she also infused the paint for the mural behind me that's on the wall that represents the roots of El Palo Alto. Paz is also a healer and she likes to do labyrinths and ceremonies and she will be leading a tour of trees of the city around Arbor Day this year and we hope that you'll join us for that. So I'm very happy to have the work of Caledonia Curry in this exhibition. She has been very uh, influential in the art and healing community. She founded a foundation called the Heliotrope Foundation, uh, which is how I discovered her. But she is known as Swoon, and she is a very famous graffiti artist, and she started doing video, which we also have a video piece in the show. She had a somewhat traumatic childhood growing up with parents who are addicted to opioids, and she lost her mother to cancer in 2013. This piece is called Memento Mori, and it's actually a portrait of her mother holding a younger version of herself, holding Caledonia as a child. So a lot of this newer work came out of therapy and work that Caledonia has done to help heal from that traumatic past. And now I'm standing next to the work of Angela Hennessy. She is an artist who deals primarily with death and grieving. And this work is called Arising. It's made from um, textiles and uh, artificial hair, which is very symbolic. It's black, it's the color of mourning. And it also represents the politicalization of black hair. Um, Angela is actually a survivor of a gunshot, so she understands the trauma of uh, injury and recovery, and that is also embedded in this weaving. Um, this is the work of Corita Kent. Um, she, it creates a moment of reflection and hope. We reach back in time 50 years for these. They were made in 1972 when she created these posters to show the long legacy of art and healing. Carita was a nun for most of her life. She led the art department at the Immaculate Heart College in Los Angeles. She was influenced by pop art and Andy Warhol, and she became a celebrated graphic designer as well as a political activist. The piece at the top, it says, we carry within us the wonders we seek without us. And another piece I like at the bottom says, me must be turned upside down to become we. And I like to include these works to show that artists have been looking for ways to heal us throughout eternity, and I like to mark the 50th anniversary of Carita's work here and thank the Carita Art Center for sharing these with us. And I'm standing in front of the work of Jonna Arnold. Jonna has put together a very ambitious project called Expanding Space. Um, usually she's thought of as a photographer, but she's also interested in the interconnectedness of all things. She started meditating a few years ago and noticed the change in her mood and outlook. And so this work actually takes people through a meditation where you leave the constraints of time and space 
and you get to focus on your body and you actually fly out over Palo Alto and the Bay Area. And then she has you fill out a form and at the photo booth behind us, take an image of yourself after you've gone through the experience to just take note of changes in your body and your mind and open yourself up to healing. And I think this is a great piece to end the show on because I hope everyone leaves this exhibition with a new feeling of calmness and renewed hope. So thank you all for joining us. I hope that you really enjoyed the exhibition and you get to come down in person and go through some of the experiences. It will be on view through the end of May, so there's plenty of time. And um, we'll also be having some great programs that you can join us for throughout the next few months. <laughs>